Hey guys, how's it going? It's Dilmar again and welcome again to the channel. So first of all, thank you very much for joining the channel. I really appreciate your time. Today I'm going to be continuing the procedural generation scripts that we worked on previously. These scripts are going to enable us to create a city in the future. I want to be able to create a city with textures and everything is going to be generated randomly. So we've been working on creating meshes, we've been working on creating cubes, quads, and also I started working on a grid system previously. So what I want to do today is I want to refactor that grid system a little bit more, add materials that are pretty fine instead of creating them randomly. So I'm going to be adding an option so that if you want to create materials randomly, you can. Otherwise, we're going to be using a default material and that's going to help with speed. I think I want to be able to control that. I want to control that through the inspector. So if the level designer decides to use random materials, they can use random materials. If they want to use a pretty fine material, they can do that as well, as well as some other options that we're going to be adding through the inspector and also looking at how we can track some of the stats so that we know if we make a change, if, it, if the process is going to be faster or if it's going to be slower. So let's jump into Unity and start working on it. All right, guys, so this is what I have right now. And we added a few more features to the grid system. I can now see, I can now tell generation statistics on the top left. And I added two different stats. One is how many ships we generated, which in this case is 40,000. And that's calculated based on the grid width and height. Also the length of time, which I calculate, you know, from the moment that the grid starts generating the system, I capture the time, then when it finishes, and then I basically just subtract the start time minus the end time and then show the difference. So what I what I have right now is you can see that this scene took quite a bit of quite a bit of time to generate, which is 23 seconds. And if I want to if I want to perf you know add performance optimizations to this, one of the things that we could do is we could add purify materials because that's basically what's taking most of the time. Every single one of these is getting their own materials. So if we have 40,000 shapes, we're basically creating 40,000 materials in memory, which is basically not preferred. So for now, what I what I ended up doing is I added a new default material. Basically, this is a material that the level designer can select. And if they decide to do that, it won't go through the routine where we create random materials. So let me show you how long that takes. So just remember this one took 23 seconds. If I uncheck the apply procedural material, it's going to now use the default material by default. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say play and I'm going to show you how long the generation takes, which is going to be much lower than 20, 23 seconds. So you can see that it took 2.8 seconds just by making that small change. And yeah, we don't have we don't have a variety of materials, but we could easily, you know, create five different materials and then select those materials to be applied randomly, which we can do in this session. And I can show you how to do that. So what I'm going to do is I want I want to also show you some of the other things that I added. So just so you know, I added this new applying procedural material default. And if you check it, it's basically going to oh, if you check it, it's also it's actually going to create a random material and then assign it to each model as it generates them. But if you uncheck it, it's basically going to use the default material. So if I expand it, I couldn't read the whole thing, which is why it was hard to tell if it was a true or a false. So if you say, yeah, if you check it, it's going to be a procedural material. If you don't check it, it's going to use the default. So that's one thing I added. And then I added some other things behind the scenes. So I'm using core routines instead of just calling a method directly. So let me show you how that was refactored. So let's go into the C Sharp project. And let me close this. And the parts that I focus on, and you can see the modifications here in the grid. Let me let me let me show you how that looks through source control. So if I go into the cube, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to collapse this and I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I changed. So Obviously, in the cube, one thing that I changed, because I don't need it right now, it's the UVs. We're not going to be applying UVs just yet, because I, I, I need to finish everything else, and then we're going to be focusing on, on textures. The other thing that I did, so that was that change for the cube. If we go to the grid system, this one was changed a little bit. And a couple of things that I did is I started adding a construction delay, and that's going to be used for showing the buildings as they get at it. For now, I'm not... 
I'm not going to be worrying too much about that value, but I'll show you how that's going to work in a later video. I also removed the building texture because we're not going to be applying UVs. And then now we have a couple of more features. So we can apply procedural materials, and that is the Boolean that I show you in the inspector, that if you set it to true, it will create a material procedurally. If you set it to false, it's going to use the one that is right here, which is default material. And this is so that the level designer can set the material that they want to use as a pretty fine value. The other things that I added was UI bindings. I wanted to know, you know how many shapes we generated and then how long it took to generate those shapes. So that's what those tools are for. And then a couple of things on the build grid is the first thing that I do is I calculate the how many shapes we have based on the width and the height, and I just multiply that. Then I calculate the start time. So the start time is going to be, you know, daytime that now I store that into a variable. And then I go through my for loop. So the for loop that you have on the left side was the for loop that we had before. So if you notice, I refactor the body of this meta into a new meta called at cell. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because I wanted to use a coroutine to speed things up. And, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So after I do that and I add all the different cells in the grid, I get the end time right after I'm done with doing all that. Then I use time spam div as a variable to calculate the end time minus the started time. That's going to give us a difference between those two times. Then what I do is I, this is for messaging. So one thing that I do, if, if I don't have, you know, if, if seconds is equal to zero, meaning that it took, you know, it took milliseconds to generate the simulation, then I'm going to display the difference in milliseconds. If the seconds was less than 100 seconds, then I display that in seconds. I basically grab the seconds from the time spam and the milliseconds from the time spam, and then I just have I just have seconds displaying. But if it took more than more than or equal to 100 seconds, then I display that in minutes, and then also display the seconds. So that's kind of just basically some messaging so that we know, you know, as we make changes, how long everything is taking. So now the refactoring part of the body of that meta. It's going to be here, so I don't think I have any more changes. So let me do this. I'm going to focus on the new version. So you know what changed now, but so the method that I'm that I'm that I change now and I refactor. So now I'm calling a, a start core routine and I call an add cell and I pass in the row and the column. So it's very similar to what we had, except we're calling a method and we're using a, a start core routine to speed things up a little bit. So if you do, if you play with coroutines before, you know that they are enumerators. And the way that this works is I declare it as a private enumerator. And the method call is going to be at cell. I pass in the row and the column. And then I basically just copy everything that I had in the body of the method, which is doing essentially the same thing that it was doing before. One thing to know is I added a new option, which is what I what I was telling you about in the beginning of the video, is I have a Boolean now. So if this one is set to true, I'm going to use the extension method that I showed you before, and I'm going to be passing in the shader name and also the cell name. So then that will generate a new material, and we'll be associating that material with the mesh render. So if I set that to false, I'm going to, I'm going to use the material that I specified by default. So that's pretty much everything that I changed as far as the code based on the previous implementation. So let me let me show you a couple more things before we before we wrap it up. So I'm going to say that I don't want to apply a procedural material. And let's just let me just show you how this, you know, how fast this is now. And if I hit play, so I'm going I'm basically going lower in numbers. And it looks like we're a little bit offset, but that's okay. So if I were to change the random C, of course this is going to be very fast because we're only dealing with 100 shapes. You can see that it's only taking a milliseconds. But the cool thing with this is I can now crank it up and say, okay, you know, I want to see, okay, now it's taking 25 milliseconds, and but there are 340 shapes. So what if I wanted to, let's increment the width and, and let's see if that impacts. So it's still about the same. Let me go down on the shape width. Let me go even smaller. 
So you can kind of see how this is so powerful because we're creating everything dynamically and procedurally. So if I change the height, now we can see we're getting some really tall shapes. Let me go smaller. What about much smaller than that, maybe a four? Kind of see how that is affecting it. Let me go lower on the on the width. There we go. What about a little bit lower? Let me do a two. How about a three? And then as I'm running this, I'm looking at I'm looking at these stats. So which are, you know, it's it's a pretty powerful feature, even though even though it's not there's not a lot of code into it, it's gonna give us a lot of information, a lot of data. Okay, what about the depth? Let's increment the depth. You can kind of see how that is changing. So let me go smaller. And let me go much smaller. There we go. So one thing that we could do is we could modify this to track the width and the height. Let's go ahead and, and add that feature because I like to change that. And as soon as I change it, it's going to regenerate the simulation. So we already have previous width and then also previous height. So with that, we can we can determine if there was a change. So it'll be similar to what we what we already did. Let me find that code. Go back in here. Yep. So so all we really need to do is just basically call this build grid right inside of these these checks because we're already checking if the previous width does not equal the new width and if the previous height does not equal the new height. So what I can do is I can just basically we can just basically call this method right here. And at this point we have, you know, we set the new width, the previous width to the new width, the previous height to the new height, and also regenerate the grid. Let me make sure that this works. So let's go ahead and hit play and see if that's going to if that's going to work. And there we go. And I can there we go. So that's that's really cool. Now I can change the width. I can change the height and we can see it running in real time. I can also I could also go smaller in here and we can go there we go. So you can tell that by changing the width and the height we're seeing some performance impacts. So if I go let me go a little bit higher. Let's go 86. So that took 408 milliseconds. So if I go what about going to that and there we go, it's generating. It took about, it still took less than a second, which is very, very fast, knowing that we're generating 11,000 different cubes. What about going much higher? That took still very fast. Oh, it's still generating. There we go, 1.6 seconds. And, but we have 21,000 different models in this scene. So I'm gonna go smaller. Let's go much smaller. Let's go, there we go. And we can, so this is cool because you're going to be, so this is another thing that we could also add. What about tracking the width, the height, and the depth so that we can make changes as soon as we make those changes. And I show you how to do that. So I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you that as a, you know, as a task if you want to do it and clone my repo. But just know that if you make those changes, you can track if there are any changes and then regenerate the simulation. There we go. So another thing that I can do here now is, let's say we have 31, about 651 shapes. So if I check the applied procedural material and I change the random seed, now we're starting to get some colors. So it starts, it starts to look a lot better. So what if we go a little bit, let me change the height. And there we go. Let me go ahead and change the shape height to be something like four. And click on the seed. What about something like, let me make it much taller and let me change the seat again. And then you're starting to see the power of this. So I'm gonna basically wrap it up here, guys. But if you have any questions about anything that I show you, please let me know. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching this video. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Also be sure to check out gamedev.net because they have amazing tutorials and resources for game developers. If you're starting out or if you're an advanced game developer, they have resources for you. Also find me in patreon.com where I'm basically posting information about what I'm doing behind the scenes, source code, early access to content. So check me out there. Thank you guys.